Welcome to the latest Evershed Sutherland Legal Insights podcast. Welcome to this Evershed Sutherland propcast. My name's Joe Gein and I'm a professional support lawyer to the real estate practice group here at Evershed Sutherland. I'm pleased to say that today I'm joined by Paula Barrett, who's a partner based in our London office, and she's global co-lead for our international privacy, data protection and cyber security team. Now, as you'll have seen from the flyer for today's session, we're going to be discussing when data privacy considerations come up, some of the key concepts and legal obligations all around that topic, and ultimately, who is responsible for what. So good morning, Paula. Good morning, Joe. Thanks very much for uh, inviting me to the PropCast. Well, thank you for joining us. So the reason why we came to you with a view to being on one of our PropCasts was as a result of two particular and um, quite recent situations that came up in our team's real estate work. One was where a client's tenant was looking to install CCTV in some of the common areas um, of, a, of a building. Um, and the second situation was where we were acting for an investor client um, and they were buying a residential uh, stabilized asset. Um, so it was a build to rent property. It was already constructed, already let to many individuals um, so that made us think about the data privacy angle and the protections that were needed. So these uh, scenarios both triggered those thoughts of coming to your team and where uh, these sorts of considerations come up in the real estate work that we do. So I suppose our first question here is where else would those who are working on the in the real estate sector, those on the podcast, um, really come across data in that data protection sense? So, uh, great question. It's coming up a lot and in different um, in different areas. So, as you mentioned, CCTV is is clearly one of those. But increasingly, um, the collection of data is growing, uh, and it's popping up in different areas. So, it might be um, you know the more traditional areas around maybe rent and payments collections data. Clearly, that could be one. Um, but as buildings themselves become more sophisticated. We're seeing it pop up, for example, in relation to energy usage. Um, simple, what might seem a simple thing, but actually, um, car parking usage. Um, the um, you know people are increasingly plugging in um, uh, electric um, power uh, to for it to enable cars to be charged, etc. Some of those that starts to trigger data collection. There's um, just looking more at occupancy in some instances, and that can be in across a range of different forms of occupant. Um, and then looking again between the, you know, the contracts between the property owner and the fund managers or the property managers. And then in that context, it, we're looking at it more from a, you know, more and more data, as I say, is, is getting collected. So it could be tenant vetting information, which could involve the, the collection of personal information. It could be, um, uh, you know, serviced office space, um, again, data collection it could be looking at very specific aspects you know we're looking we're seeing more sophisticated use of entry systems um so as as buildings at one level get smarter that will often involve data getting collected and often that will be data about individuals or be it even maybe getting aggregated but it starts off with data being um, collected about individuals and, and that's where it starts to percolate up into these broader conversations in the sector. See how it, it, it's all pervasive and how you get these overlaps between the areas. So something that we're seeing quite a lot of now is as uh, certainly landlords are improving energy efficiency of buildings, things like the minimum energy efficiency standards and that sort of thing, which at one point might look like a, a real energy focused um, area and, and policy point. Actually, the data protection feeds massively into that because of all of that data which landlords need to be assessing, need to be considering, but of course, need to be um, properly dealing with um, in order to address all obligations across this sort of multitude of, of legal areas. So what we've got, obviously, is a really technical area of law, real world consequences. Um, and something that's really evident here is, is there a key concepts that we all need to need to get to grips with need to understand um so maybe you could just give us a, a sort of high level explanation of personal data and um, what we mean by things like data controller and, and also data processor because those seem to be uh, the, the key key uh, concepts here the key roles yes. and, and maybe why 
uh, identifying these correctly really matters. Absolutely. So you're, you're absolutely right. One of the um, interesting things in, in particular in, in, in this sector is to try and work out who is the controller and who's who, who you know, what other roles are that which may include a, a data processor. Um, the reason that's very important um, is that the data protection legislation um, I, puts different obligations on different categories of player, if you like, and the controller is um, carries the most responsibility. Um, controller, in a nutshell, is it, it, whoever's um, deciding what is going to happen, what data is going to be collected, what's going to be done with the data. Um, there is a category of um, participant known as a, a data processor. That's tip now. That's typically a service provider. Now, in this sector, that's quite interesting because people will often assume are oh, um, the role of someone who's um, managing the building or someone who's providing facilities um, management or etc. Um, security it might just be um, uh, a processor. But it's not just about titles as, of service provider. You have to look at what they're doing, who is making the de who is deciding what happens to that data when it's collected, who it's given to, who's you know what data is being collected. So you, you have to start digging a bit further, peeling back from um, maybe the, some of the more traditional models and actually looking deep more deeply as what's happening now. Does this really fit? Are you actually a service provider or are you in fact a controller or dare I say a joint controller? Because um, there is a concept of joint controllership um, which is uh, where in essence you've got more than one um, party deciding what happens to the data and as the phrase um, suggests it means you're jointly responsible um, under the legislation for that and that carries up a bunch of requirements so having worked out who is the controller you then have you know controller responsibilities are typically to identify um that well a to be transparent about what you're collecting so give appropriate notices B, and really importantly, to work out what your legal basis is for that collection, because our laws base are premised on the basis that you have to have a legal basis in order to collect the data. If you don't have the legal basis, you can't collect it. So you do have to work out, you know, is it because it's necessary for a contract? Is it something that's required by law? Is it legitimate interest? Is it consent? So you have to work that through. And then there are other, obviously, important obligations around keeping the data secure, not using it for other purposes, um, unless there's a legal basis and you've told people about it. Um, rules around restrictions of transfers to jurisdictions in other places, um, and making sure the data is, 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 is indeed kept up to date and accurate, for example. So there, there are a whole bunch of things that tag on to the controller responsibility. If you're a processor, um, it's, it's a combination of things. You end up with some direct responsibilities more to do with how you contract with the controller and keeping the data secure and reporting if there are security breaches. Um, you both as controllers and processors have responsibilities around what your contract says. Um, and there are quite prescriptive requirements about what goes into a contract with a processor. I'll pause there because I could, I could talk for quite some time about <laughs> what uh, the requirements are. Well, I suppose what's really clear about that is it's about asking the right questions at the right time, because something that might seem a little bit obvious actually isn't. And we get into these, you know, very detailed analyses there of things like joint processes and things like that, and mm. who, who is in charge and how the, the contracts actually work. So is it fair to say that with these sorts of relationships, with these, uh, I suppose, these analyses that you're carrying out in your team, it's very much a substance, not form. So you can't really take an off the peg scenario. It's about what does each contract, each person actually practically do um, and how you tie that all in. Is that fair? Absolutely fair. Um, because ultimately the degree of engagement um, the, of um, you know, property owners, uh, what the, each individual service provider, managing agent might do um, is, you know, it does actually differ. Um, in, in across different concepts um, and, and structures um, that that we're seeing, and, and so you know, as you said, you know, at, at the outset, you know, putting a camera on the side of a building has different consequences um, for, for for a whole bunch of different clients, depending on the nature of how that um, asset is managed, 
um, but by the property owner and, and how you deal with the delegation of that. Um, and indeed, that might even change across the portfolio of assets. So, yeah, and then perhaps stick into it. Anecdotally, in a way, um, when you're dealing with these uh, these transactions, let's say, for example, you're acting on behalf of an investor who, who owns a, a building and it's multi-let. Mm. If one of the tenants approaches the landlord saying, you know, we'd like to put CCTV up, that seems relatively discreet, relatively small scale, probably to that tenant. Mm. So anecdotally, how do you uh, you find that those those negotiations then run and how is it that you take those people with you to say, look, we've all got these obligations and, and here's how we work together to make sure that we're all doing exactly what we need to do? Yeah, it, it can be something of an education um, with um, to actually talk people through, because very often that we'll get a sort of, oh, that's, you know, maybe this hasn't been an issue before if they're, you know, depending on the tenant or, um, you know, actually we need to um, understand it a bit, bit more closely and think about um, what it is they want to do and why, um, and some of the implications for them as well as for the landlord. So it is often an element of talking you through what's the objective, how best to achieve it, um, and then and making sure people understand the associated risks that they are taking on, um, and the and the pursuant you know the obligations that will flow from that um, for, for for each of them respectively. To follow that one through then, um, I suppose my next question is, is sort of one in two parts. Um, firstly, what's obvious is there are significant obligations here. Um, and with significant obligations come significant consequences if they're breached. Um, so, so firstly, I'd like to, to understand or for you to take us through a little bit of what those, those are. But then second to that as a sort of follow-up, and you touched on this um, a little bit earlier, is to the extent that these obligations might be outsourced, because of course, to go back to my um, my investor uh, example that, that I, I mentioned earlier, if an investor buys a property um, which is let, more often than not, they'll have managing agents who will deal with all of this. They will deal with the interface with the tenants. They will deal with the day-to-day -day management of the building. So if you are a, an investor, perhaps you might look to outsource um, to your managing agents the, the data protection element because they're the yeah. ones holding it. So, so I suppose the, the the two facets of the question there are really, firstly, um, what are the consequences of not getting this right, and then secondly, how well protected is somebody if they seek to outsource compliance with those those uh, obligations? Okay, so I think there's a number, of, as you said, of interesting points there um, as to how if if indeed you can outsource um responsibilities because if you are the controller um you might um ask somebody to carry out um certain things for you but ultimately um you remain liable so um if you are the um relevant controller um the key thing is you know is to recognize that ultimately you remain you remain um, you can't absolve yourself necessarily of responsibility. Re you remain liable. Um, and I think it's also important to remember um, that what we've often seen is that even if there is a, um, uh, an instance where ultimately you might say, well, okay, actually, maybe it's my agent who is taking responsibility for, for, for doing this. Um, you've got the, 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 the um, some interesting technical concepts um, around whether or not you're still culpable anyway from an agency perspective. So it, it sort of, it rolls, it could roll back up. It could equally be that there may only be very limited circumstances where you make a call for the data and somebody else is, is, is managing the day to day, but as the, as the investor, you still might take on the, the the more data, you know, some of the direct responsibilities again as well. So I think the th the key thing is one understand when you are the controller, the degree to which you are actually effectively passing on the responsibility or just sharing it, um, um, and then um, thinking about the responsibility and from a risk assessment perspective, because there is, you know, technically you can be liable for 4% of, 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 of group global turnover is the, is the high end um, of, of fines. Now, I'm not going to say that that happens frequently, 
but that's you know it's a, it's a potentially a significant amount of money and i think in practice what we are starting to see is more enforcement that's touching some of this so there was a recent case actually in the context of, a, of facilities management where ultimately the third party was running all the access controls into the building decided to deploy biometric um, technology in so doing um, and, but ultimately, in that instance, the um, uh, owners of the building, as well as um, the facilities manager, were found to be joint controllers and jointly responsible um, uh, for not dealing with, you know, for in, not appropriately undertaking the due diligence um, about the deployment of that technology. So it is something, and in that particular case, they didn't get fined, they were told to stop. <laughs> The processing, but it's very, it's quite a public case. It's not from a brand perspective necessarily where any of those in concerned wanted to be. So it's something to be aware of. We are seeing some more of this come up, particularly in the context of deployment of cameras um, and the deployment of facial recognition in particular um, at this point in time. So we're seeing then there's a sort of range of uh potential consequences here yes. so at the top end would be that four percent of global absolutely turnover yeah um and then how does that work down towards i suppose away from the seriousness of that four percent what what other tools are in the arsenal of the uh the enforcing authorities on on those ones yeah so so as they can stop you from processing um, they can, uh, and that can be more expensive than you might believe. Um, they can force you to actually issue notices. Um, and for a number of organizations, that is an extremely costly exercise um, to do. Um, I think it's also worth thinking about I mean, so the public reprimands um, that they can issue as well. Again, not something that, um, particularly for some property owners who mm -hmm. like to, you know, have a low public profile, that is not something necessarily something that they would want to see either. Um, so there's there's a range of, of things. And that's, as I say, the, the um, regulatory aspect of it. What we're seeing also alongside that is the, is the, um, that's the litigation and claims that might flow from it. So there could be breach of contract related claims. Uh, between number of parties that would need to be worked through um, and then also potentially claims from individuals who believe that their rights have been um, not not respected or maybe there's been a breach that's come up and, and the, so there's a whole number of things that they could seek um, to raise claims in respect of it so it's multifaceted in terms of thinking about the risks associated. And so then um, sort of going back to the the earlier question around outsourcing and you, you you said how you can't sort of absolve yourself of responsibility for these things by outsourcing, but presumably what we see in in those contractual arrangements between uh, between the parties are lots of cross indemnities and things like that and obligations and perhaps monitoring and things like that to allow a sort of practical, almost like a step in right to not just to get contractual comfort that this is being done properly, but the ability to go in to check, to monitor, to audit, things like that. Yes, that can be uh, indeed um, in, within the um, arrangement. Um, you know, and we see that, I mean, obviously, particularly if there is any sort of joint controllership, there needs to be some allocation of responsibility between the parties as to how they're going to handle things jointly. Where there's a service provider, proce which are processors, then equally you are also seeing um, you have very specific provisions that you have to add in to regulate the arrangement. And then if it, if it's you know, so I think there's a whole range of things. The other thing. I'd, also want to mention here is that increasingly we are seeing more data um, and therefore there's you know there's, there's that there's areas of recognizing that actually data it might just be a really important asset not just the actual um the bricks and mortar but the data itself that is being collected in the course of operating that business could be really important um for the investor um, for example, so because um, there's all sorts of different things that come out of that data, as, as I said earlier about if we're trying to create smart environments, understanding how a building is used um, could be quite important to then future developments. I see. So to, to pick up on that point, it's that, that value in the data, which mm -hmm. I suppose can be informing future moves, policies, Absolutely. structures, all that sort of thing. But also, I suppose there is now what we're seeing more and more uh, intrinsic value in data 
um, and, and how that can be passed on between parties and, and all, the, all the controversy that comes with that. In terms of how um, a party is able to address that those points, so there being this value in data, whether that is on the practical or the, or the, the more commercial side of things, um, I mean, it's, it's a wide question, but briefly, how do parties look to address that, almost future-proofing their arrangements so that they can perhaps exploit that in the future? So I think it is, um, there's a number of things. It's, it's having that conversation up front, what might the future, what, what, what might they want to achieve going forward? Um, and then um, you know, you, it might be that um, ultimately one party is going to lead that going forward and, and understanding their respective allocation of, of responsibilities to, to make that happen. Because there's there's one thing in terms of what the contract says, but then there could be quite a lot of knock-on effects and responsibilities. So how are you going to deal with transparency? Um, if there is a requirement to get consent, who's going to go and get it from the from um, the relevant individuals? Um, if you're relying on, a, on another legal basis, how is that, um, uh, you know, what is that legal basis? How is it going to be worked through? So I think it's upfront conversations um, to try and make sure that you're, you're, you are thinking forward about the, the, the possibilities um, and then looking at who, who might have control. Now, equally, um, in the current climate, particularly as people get more interested in other technologies, it may equally be that um, people want to kind of keep control um, and so they might actually say, you know, we, we don't want you, any, you deploying alternative technologies and data mining here. We actually want you just to use it for these particular purposes. And anything else, you come back to us and then we work it through subsequently as to whether or not we want to do it and what steps would be required. So we take the appropriate risk assessments and take the appropriate steps to make it happen lawfully. I see. So then you're looking at, well, what's our core business here? What's our core yes. aims and how do we achieve that? Yeah, Understood. Exactly. Um, and just I suppose moving on to my final question here, looking forward, short to midterm, in terms of what's on the horizon here in terms of the, the real estate world and how it interacts with your specialist area, what are you expecting to see um, in, in that? More and more use of data. Um, I think, biz, you know, real estate, um, like ultimately from a sectoral perspective, seems to be increasingly hungry for data for lots of different reasons. It, it's either it's generating more data um, and it's starting to wake up more to the possibilities of what that data could be used for, um, for the benefit of the sector and indeed the investors and, and other, par you know, other parties, um, you know, managing agents, et cetera, um, may be able to you know, harvest that data to make their you know, delivery of their services more efficient, um, to make um, the delivery, you know, the, you know, the buildings we create more efficient, um, you know, better from an energy perspective, um, as well as other requirements about, as you alluded to earlier, reporting requirements that will, um, that will pop up. Um, so I think that we are expecting to see more data and therefore more focus on what happens to it so that you know, the objectives can lawfully be uh, achieved. Now, if you think about what's happening from a technology perspective, I mentioned earlier, we, see, you know, we are already seeing um, more and more cameras go up. Um, those cameras are becoming more intelligent um, in terms of and the, the back end of what's behind those cameras is also becoming more intelligent. So um, increased use of facial recognition, either on looking outward and there are more and more controls over the use of, of um, facial recognition in the public um, domain but we're seeing more and more demand for that in the in inside of buildings too so you know, if you as part of security access controls for example much more sophisticated use of that um, we're also seeing it um, you know more broadly de de deployment of biometrics um, it doesn't have to be just facial recognition um, for security and other purposes, um, ultimately, as I say, AI technology, not necessarily, I'm not necessarily actually thinking about Gen AI per, te per se, but different forms of AI are being used more broadly um, to, in essence, undertake a form of data mining in a lot of instances to, to better understand uh, what's happening within a particular environment. environment. So more use of it. And I think, therefore, it means people are um, 
going to be looking at that more carefully. And some of that might come from different layers of the of the overall real estate um, um, uh, environment, if you like. So it could be that managing agents are going to become more sophisticated in looking at what they do across the range of properties they care for. Um, so, you know, they could be individual service providers are looking more specifically to understand what's happening with data. And that could actually change their role. Um, if they're starting to use data for their purposes, that could see them become a controller where perhaps otherwise they might not have been. So there's, there's different ways in which this greater deployment of technology will mean that we've got to revisit things and, and as we touched on earlier, actually look at the specifics of what's happening um, within the particular um, matter in front of us. I see. I think that's um, a great point on which to to wrap up. Um, so that does bring us to the end of this Evershed Sutherland podcast. So just to say thank you very much, all of you, for joining, um, and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you for listening to the Evershed Sutherland Legal Insights Podcast.